think this book is important. I've been here for a very long time, as again, like Bonnie, over 30 years. And when I, throughout those years, I have been told by many people in this country, people of influence, people in, in, in positions of power, and also from the black community here, that there is no racism in this country. Okay, and it is something that is constantly said, and to this day, not back in the day, but even to this day. So this collection of stories for me is monumental because it really gathers together these stories. And I think, you know, it is really, the, it's the threads that have woven sort of Britain's sort of social cloth. And that is really what really helps me or motivates me to be here today. So I would really like to turn, firstly, to Suzette, because I really wanted to understand this collection of amazing stories um, really, what, why? What motivated you and why this book? Um, basically, the initial um, motivation was the response to the murder of George Floyd. Um, and I say that because actually the piece that I contributed to the book and I wrote the book in the book and the piece was actually the piece that I sent out um, along with Suzanne. She also sent out her piece to prospective um, contributors. We felt if we're going to ask other people to share something, we have to share something too. And the catalyst for me was basically, um, it was sometime after, it was the June, so it was after the May murder of Joy Floyd, um, George Floyd, and I was on my way to my mother's, and somebody had sent me a WhatsApp message. It was a lovely message that showed a montage of... Um, Young women. I mean, I mean, I might read it at some point. Should I just? I, I'm just going to read a bit of this because actually, when you ask this question, this is the answer as to why or or what spurred me. Here we go. I'm just going to read a little bit of it. <clears throat> Touching the light paper. In the midst of coronavirus mayhem worsening news of sly and violent acts of racism and protest marches, I received a WhatsApp message. A WhatsApp message with a montage of beautiful African women to the soundtrack of Beyonce's Brown Skin Girl. The banner, Being Black is Not a Crime, came up on the screen. I smiled broadly. How beautiful. How cute. How... How I began to cry. It seemed from nowhere, but it was clear it was from deep, deep within my psyche. That WhatsApp message lit the touch paper. I was crying for the five-year-old me who had already known at that young age that the world thought her ugly because the world did not value her brown skin. The world did not think her skin just like pearls, did not think her skin glowed like diamonds. I was crying for a world where brown girls feel compelled to bleach their skin to comply with the world's ideal of beauty, and that ideal is a white one. And I cried, big fat hot tears, cried for the girl who at five felt the weight of racism although she did not understand it. I cried for the girl who was never caught playing kiss chase because of her black brown skin. I cried for the girl mocked daily by her primary school teacher for having a Welsh surname and a brown skin. The little Welsh girl who isn't Welsh. I cried for the teenage me and the humiliation I felt as I was verbally abused and then punched in the face by a grown man on a tube train filled with passengers. And as I sat in that moment, crumpled and worn from crying, I felt overwhelmed and pessimistic. And as I sat in that moment, I thought of all that had changed since the 70s when I was growing up, and all that hadn't. I thought of the many, many assaults on my character that I had survived despite living in a racist society the many, many assaults I had survived. I thought of my Caribbean ancestors who not only survived, but had created a rich culture out of the torture that was their world. 
It's been a long struggle. I remember my father's cousin putting a free Angela Davis poster up in our front room window. I remembered how Linton Quasi Johnson's poem, Sonny's Letter, reverberated around our front room as it played on our stereo. How my parents, with Auntie Estelle and Uncle Vincent, nodded, in, nodded their heads and shared their tales of struggle in 1960s London. And then I remembered the chant, 13 dead, nothing said. I remembered the Black People's Day of Action, I thought of the many, many names on banners that had been carried in the fight against, for justice. The many, many names. I am the daughter of survivors, and I have thrived. I have thrived, and I will not let the pain of racism soak up my joy. And um, there's more, but I'll, that's mainly. So this was part, this was, um, part of what I sent out, um, because... Suzanne and I, with another group, other group of women that we um, had written with, were all speaking about our responses to the Joy Floyd, George Floyd murder. I don't know why I keep saying Joy. I'm thinking of Joy Gardner, that's somebody else who, was, um, who died at the hands of police in this country. Um, and we knew that if we'd felt this impact, other people had too, and we wanted to know what they felt what their stories were, and we felt it was important. And so that was why we came up with putting the book together, because we knew we wanted to put it in a book form. Uh, we wanted to do something with it. Um, and when we sent out the, um, our letters, asking people if they would be prepared to be one of our 100 voices, we were overwhelmed with the impact of the messages that we got back, where people felt either they were able to do it or not able to do it, which we're probably going to go into. Yeah. Actually, I was going to ask you, yeah. is that possible? Because one of the most powerful, although the word you use, which is what touched me most about this whole endeavor, this book, was the word thrive. Because so throughout, uh, even though there's stories of struggle and difficulties and challenges, what comes through is the resilience and actually the joy and the embrace of what our community, what we have to offer. So that comes through very Yeah, strong. I mean, that was something yeah. we were very, um, we were very determined. We didn't want it just to be a vetch. We didn't want people just to be saying, oh, oh, this was not, this is not what we wanted. We wanted people to speak about the fact that, well, their experiences in whatever way they chose, um, the, that was the brief. We gave a word count. Um, some people adhered to it better than others. We also said they could create a piece of um, artwork if they wanted, or anything they could, you know, a poem, it just express it as they wished. And we wanted to also know how you still, despite this, became the wonderful, incredible person that you were. And that was really, really important because it had to be hopeful because, you know, if you're alive and you believe in change and you want any kind of change, you've got to be optimistic. You have to be optimistic. And we both come from that kind of background and also, as I say, I mean, I say that, I, I acknowledge my ancestors, and they created a rich culture out of something that was basically a torture, a, a life of torture. So basically, I'm here, I am part of a dream of my ancestors, as my, you know, to misquote my Angelou, and that is true. And so we are here, we are thriving, and that's really, really important. So that was very, very important. Yeah. But on the other side, as, mm. as we just touched on, one of the most powerful sort of messages that came through were the people who declined to participate and yeah. why? Yeah, they were, um, we understood that. There were some people who just basically said they didn't feel that they could speak more about this. They were tired of it. Some people felt that they didn't want to be part of a book that was going to be read by people and was somehow going to be somehow, not entertainment, but any kind of way. They just want their experiences that way. Some people felt they couldn't revisit these um, experiences. They felt that they'd tucked them away so tightly they didn't want to go there. Um, some people also, somebody put it very well, and we have a few quotes in the book, but somebody said, you know, I just don't feel I've got the headspace to go there. I'm just, I just don't want to do it. I'm tired. Um, and somebody else spoke about the fact that if, if they were going to open up, there'd be like three books. <laughs> if they were going to start, the floodgates would open and that was it. And, and so we appreciated the fact that for some people it was really, really going to be much more difficult than you might imagine to begin with. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I was just going to quickly, um, before inviting um, um, Bonnie and Albie, um, that just a few of the quotes that I don't think I will, I'll be able to contribute to your project right now because I am also weary about reliving some of the experiences so frequently. Um, I'm very moved by these pieces. It's almost too much to have to dredge up memories, which I, I'm sure is the case for many. I don't think I can find the proper time and headspace for your needs. My suspicion is that I don't want to go there. So I just think it just shows the real difficulty of, of sharing these stories from, for some many people. And, and often we, uh, I would say, you know, I grew up, I'm half black and half Japanese. I grew, I grew up in, in Japan where I was the only, with my sister, the only non-Japanese person within any radius of my life. So those, the kind of, the trauma, I guess, mm. of having to deal with those kinds of, isol that bit of isolation is, 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 is difficult. And, it, and for many people, it is truly trauma. And I think being asked sometimes to relive it, it, it you know, is a real challenge. So, so in that vein, I thought I might move on to our two guest voices here. So Bonnie, uh, first of all, um, we'd love to hear your contribution in, within the uh, book, I'd like but I'd love to know why you decided to say yes to this project. Because Suzette and Suzanne asked me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was also, I mean, we were very blessed because we reached out to um, our initial community. We're both actors, and so we spoke to actors. And then we went further because we knew we didn't just want it to be a book of middle-aged <laughs> actresses. So we had to go for younger people, older people. But basically, and friends, other friends mentioned other somebody else who would do it or they were interested. And then we also went to specific places to try and make sure that, for instance, we got scientists. We made links with people and got to certain places. But yes, we had people. We were astounded and so thankful for the generosity of everyone who trusted us with their words, and said yes. So yes. I, I, um, I, I um, it's, it's a lot to say. Um, I've recently been uh, really lucky to get back in touch with my, my self, my seven and five year old self who had no idea what a black person was and could care less. And um, that's a very good space for me to be, and that's where I am. And um, uh, I'm working on a children's book about this this child, and I just remembered I used to tell uh, stories to the whole street when I was a little girl, and we all all the stories were about transcendence. They weren't about being unhappy or sad or anything. We just lived in our own world, and all these little children did, um, and you do as a child. So, I. Um, Suzette and I were just having this conversation. I generally don't reread anything I've written, so I have no idea what I've said here. Um, <laughs> and I may not even feel this way anymore, but um, um, I'm working on a project at the British Museum. On It's called The Era of Reclamation, and it's really allowed me to get in touch with that kind of person that I was, and hopefully I still am. Anyway. A Descendant of Transcendence. You don't want me to read the whole thing. No, no, not the whole just thing. Just read what, we, we, what yes. you want me to. I don't know where I ought to, but just, I think it should start. Do you want me to go? If I can read it, I can see it. I've recently realized, through the attention and loving care of a person dear to me, that I have been an artist all my life. Thing is, I made theater before I had seen any. Drew painted on my mom's brown shopping bags in which she used to bring home groceries, watched vintage Hollywood movies, and loved European cinema. I wrote my very own versions. I can tell you a lot about Truffaut and Fassbender. At about 10, I announced in my catechism class in my Roman Catholic school that I understood the Holy Trinity, that God could be three in one. I pointed out that water could be three in one, solid, vapor, liquid, and still be water. Uh, my teacher told me in a loud voice that it was not possible for me to understand because, quote, the Holy Trinity is a mystery. It being a Friday, we went to the school hall uh, to see a movie. 
This was a Tarzan flick featuring people who look like me, running around, screaming, and bug-eyed, putting people into cooking pots with Cheetah, the fabulous chimpanzee, observing it all from on high. This was an elite education for a black a girl called Negro in the late 1950s and early 1960s in the USA in what was called the ghetto where I was brought up. I knew that I was lucky that our dad worked six nights a week at the can. I know that I was lucky that our dad worked six nights a week at the at the can making factory to pay for our fees, books, uniforms, bus money, and lunches. Problem was that I knew and saw no girls like me who did the things that I wanted to do. Being a teenager in the late 60s, and especially 1968, I did all of the proper activist things except participate in burning down my own community and chucking rocks at the police. Too politely brought up to do any of that. But I cut my hair short and wore it in its natural state, which I have done ever since, and tried to find a way to express myself and be present for the community. Sometimes these things conflicted. They still do. Racism for me was a given. It was a built-in assumption about my intelligence, my intention, my goals, and my destiny. It took a long time to see and understand this because I built defense mechanisms in order to stay alive as me. Unfortunately, I learned to be careful about some fellow black people too because we can internalize racism and spit it out as class distinction, nationalism, and gender. I'm old enough to have seen every movement and nothing is new to me, just packaged differently and with different slogans because what racism does is infantilize, never allows growth and maturity, no past achievements. Racism, lights. racism <laughs> only, racism mainly like slavery was and is about erasure. This is the number one enemy of people of color, erasure, but it is hard to tell this to young people. Sometimes the best thing to do is to let them find out things on their own. I had to find out things on my own too. Right now for me is about the elimination of erasure and it doesn't bother me at all what price I pay to do this because the child of erasure is fantasy. Wakanda was invented by a white cartoonists. He was not thinking of me. I cannot say that I am hopeful for the future in the sense that you can put that phrase on some greeting card, but I come from a people who decided to live and not die, so that my credo, that is my credo and my life. Every day is strong and good. I learn a lot. If I'm lucky to have a deathbed, I will be learning there too. Being what Witten Marcellus said about his late father, the great Ellis Marcellus, who died of COVID-19, Witten said of his father, he went out of life like he lived, facing reality. I'm not here for sentiment, not politics, nor politics in any formal sense. Everything political now anyway is a variation on the activity and causes of my youth. This is hard to say and to face, but real change takes a long, long time. The system is built to absorb change. You must get older, like some, to see this. But if your ancestors were sold into slavery, forced onto a boat towards what must have seemed to them to be oblivion, then you are this, a descendant of transcendence. Just be that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Bonnie. Can I just ask you, you said when you started, you weren't sure that you still thought those things. How do you feel having read that now? Oh, I thought it was, I thought, wow, okay, I wrote that. Uh, <laughs> that's the first thing I thought. And, and then I thought, um, a descendant of transcendence. Oh, that's good, too. I, I, I am, you know. I mean, it's like Suzette said. I mean, I think, um, you know, part of this project that I'm doing is, 
I call it the boat. And the fact that all of us who are of African descent and, and you know, African here descent, somebody decided to live. Somebody made that decision. Now, they, now how or why or what they did, but they did. So we have a strong transcendence gene in us. And we also have a strong gene about being in the present. Uh, we are a people who are very, very uh, geared to understanding what the present is about and its requirements. As, as Witten said about his father, Ellis, the great Ellis Marcellus, dying of COVID-19, of all things, saying he faced what was necessary. And that's what we are children of, too. So thank that's you. pretty much what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, Albie, I, I will ask you the same question. And I think because you are from a, a younger generation as well, and, and I think what's important about this book is it stretches across the generation. We, we're not talking about things that were only you know, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, but even things much more recent. So, so I really welcome to hear from you. First of all, why you wanted to participate in this project, and if we could hear from your, your story. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, well, similarly to Bonnie, it was because Suzette and Suzanne asked me. Um, and I do anything for Suzette. She's basically like my second mother. Um, but also because I felt that um, I had a story to tell, which might be a little bit different from other people's stories. Um, and I thought it was important that um, the wide range of different black voices get heard in a project like this, because we're not one homogenous group of people. I know that when we tick a box on the census, everyone would like to think that we are, but we're not. Um, some of us vote differently, some of us love differently, some of us think differently, some of us are from the Caribbean, others are from Africa. Um, so black is not one homogenous group of people, and I, don't, I find the whole, um, that the grouping of BAME, black and minority ethnic, quite problematic. The world. Um, the and so I, I, wanted, I wanted to contribute to the wide variety of different voices that appear in this book and the diversity that is within what we call in this country diverse groups. And just before you start, that thing about, because um, now I do something else on those boxes where you have to tick. I tick black, because it says black British, and then it says Caribbean, African, whatever. So I don't do that. I tick other, because at some point we've got to stop ticking these other boxes because I am here, I was born here, my parents came here, my children are born here, their children are likely to be born here. So I'm not denying, because I, my ancestors, I am very proud of my ancestry, but I am black British. And that is something that I think I, am, I have to take on board and own and claim. And that's what I'm, I'm doing by not marking that part of the box anymore, because that makes it, yeah, anyway, that's, that's just but something I, I just wanted to add to that. I have a friend who uh, he says every time he comes into this country, um, which he has to do a lot, he's working here, he says he sees this, he's white, and he has to check white. I said, just do other next time. Don't, don't, don't hit white. He said, what? I said, just don't check it. Just put other, and don't put white anymore. Yeah. So he's yeah. not going to. Other. Well, that's true, because there's somebody else said that, that oh. He's yep. other. He, he's he ticks every box as other. <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> that was about Andre. He ticks every box as other. That's what my daughter said. Yeah, I think that's what we need to do. We're all other. We're all other. Because <laughs> we're all tick. somebody else. <laughs> For somebody. Yeah. But go on, Albie. Give my piece of reader. Hope you like it. Or I don't know. Um, so from when we're children, we can tell what is good and what is bad, right and wrong from what our friends, family, teachers, and other people tell us. But no one told me that white was good and black was bad. So how does a child figure that out? Its foundations may come from structural racism, fallout from Europe's colonial past, and the racial hierarchy empire left, but also a dysfunctional father-son relationship. My father was largely absent during my childhood. When he was around, he was imperious with his belief of what it meant to be black, revealed by his African parental style, calling me a Kim instead of Albie, insisting what food I should and shouldn't eat, how he wanted my hair to be cut, and the things he wanted me to have an interest in. 
He seemed disappointed that I took more of an interest in my English heritage over my Ghanaian heritage, that I preferred my mother to him, white over black. Blackness felt forced upon me as a child, so I rejected it. But it's more than that. Strangely, looking back, it has been reaffirmed much of the time by how I've been treated by fellow black people. At secondary school, other black students often made comments like, why do you speak like that? You speak like a white person. Coconut, Oreo, Halfie, and Batty Boy. My friends were people I knew from primary school. We all spoke the same because we all came from the same primary school. We were all academic. For whatever reason, we spoke the same in a white way. I was so badly bullied at my first school that I left. Not only did I not want to be around my school bull bullies, I didn't want to be anything like them. At my second school, I was inadvertently one of four black students in my year. It also happened to be one of the best schools in London. The bullying stopped. University was more diverse with how people looked, but less, less so with regard to background. I learned about black history and discovered my sexuality. I was introduced to colonialism, post-colonialism, patriarchy, gender theory, Kinsey scale, unconscious bias, amongst other things. I elected to take modules on black courses. Fanon, Césaire, and Dubois taught me about blackness in a way my father could not. I was also introduced to other ideas which I questioned and rejected. No platforming, cancel culture, cultural appropriation, anti-capitalism, and anti-free speech. Those who didn't roll their eyes and laugh laugh when I asked those questions and advocated for free speech, free markets, and free minds, tended to be white. It felt similar to being back at school, but I could speak for myself and knew I was a good debater. So there was, and there was no threat of violence, that, so there was an element of relishing the disagreements that I got into. Entering employment at a city financial services firm, I found myself one of four black people in a client-facing, revenue-generating role in the London office. Most of our support staff were black, one with a first-class law degree from Bristol University. All of the cleaners were black, and we wound up in a similar place as we have done in every paragraph of this entry. White good, black bad. Many of the reasons why we keep returning to this are out of our control. Racism and its causes cannot be dismantled unilaterally. But as black people, we can do more with what we do control, chiefly how we treat one another, and what we define as black versus white. My education, work, and life experiences have allowed me to understand blackness and the reasons why people are racist in the broader context of history, philosophy, economics, and policy decisions. Thus, the homophobia I faced from black students at school, the reasons why I was terrified to come out to my African family and not my English family, and why one of my only black friends at work was a top Bristol law graduate but worked in a support role. However, it has also taught me that there is not one way to be black, not one way to think, to vote, to dress, to listen to music, love, speak, or behave. We speak often about, about the limits that society imposes on us as a result of racism, but little about the, about the limits we put on ourselves by defining whether or not something is black. There is not one way to be black, there is, not what, there is not one black or white way to speak. Who we love is not black and white. Our lives are not black and white, so good and bad are not black and white. As black people, we should empower each other to go forth and paint the world black in whichever area we please, not decide which parts are black and which parts aren't. Racism is real, but we don't need to oppress each other into our individual ideas of what black is on top of everything else. We are all black, beautiful, and brave. Let's always strive to see that in each other, especially when we may disagree, when we live in a society which does not always see that in us. And I'd just like to address that to the gentleman in the red suit. Well done, well done, well done, well done. Well done. Can, I, can I say something, Patricia? I'm, you know, first of all, I'm glad everybody's up here, but I'm really glad you are. And you know, I, it, you just reminded me, um, I did a debate at uh, Cambridge Union uh, Jesse Jackson was my opponent. Don't ever do that, folks. 
Okay, but I thought, this is for the students, it's not for me. You know, I'm doing it so that they could see two sides of the question. I thought it was, you know, we're at the university, we're at Cambridge, and this is a way for people to see two sides. So it wasn't personal. I mean, I was more on Jesse's side than I was on mine. But I thought, you know, I'm going to be with, for the children, for the young people, so they can get, a, <laughs> get another side, right? So I stupidly took the other side of this debate with Jesse Jackson. And uh, I grew up in Chicago, and Jesse was like, you know, it's OK. So Jesse was Jesse, and you know, beautiful, incredible, la, la, la. And I took the other side. The debate was, it is the American dream open to all? And Jesse said no. And I said, well, of course it is. How did we get to be here? You know, so the black students there in that room, I, and I didn't know anything about what was going on on campuses because I'm not, I wasn't in academia. I, I just didn't know. Um, they went ballistic. And what was really interesting to me was I was the only woman, black woman, on that whole thing. And that didn't matter to them. Because you see, in my day, you didn't fire on a sister in public like that. You just didn't do that. That was not done. Um, these kids did anyway. But what they came up with was just a bunch of jargon. And I was frightened, not for myself, but because I thought, no, I said to them, one, one, one young lady stood up and screamed at me about something, and I said, let me tell you something. And I had to get real. I said, you are going to graduate with a degree from Cambridge, OK? Do you understand? And the minute you put that down on a piece of paper, nobody's going to ask you what color you are. You're going to get through the door. I'm not going to get through the door. So you need to understand your place and your privilege. Everything is not the same. And I see folks rushing around, especially these elite universities screaming about this and that, and 85% of the people who are out there with people of color, they're not going to have these opportunities. They're not going to have any of that. So I just wanted to say that I'm glad you're here because um, we need, how can I put the word? We're going down a tunnel, and it's not a good one. And um, I find a lot of people don't know their history. They don't really know it. They don't know it. And so that's used against us. And it's one reason we can't go, we don't go as far forward as we can, because people are repeating stuff. And I um, am sort of an amateur physicist, and, and I know that a system absorbs everything. And the system has learned how to deal with us. And it does. And it does. And all these people who were screaming about the Emmys, I remember because I had friends on the, in, the, in, the, in the, Emmy, um, the Emmy thing. And they were all screaming about the fact that there weren't any people of color uh, didn't win any awards this time. Well, that's not what y'all asked for. What you asked for was to be involved. Well, the system let you be involved. It didn't give you anything. And so I, my point is that we have to move this argument along because it's still in some spaces that have been around for 50 years. And the system's already learned that one, learned that one, learned it. Could I just ask you, just on two, two points that you raised. So recently, so a lot of the work I do is around access to funding for, for mm. black businesses. Mm. That's what I mm. try to mm. focus on. I was at a recent dinner um, with uh, some amazing black business mm. owners and investors, et cetera. And this one really amazing woman, black woman, who um, went to like a Cambridge, you know, Oxbridge, you know, highly educated, highly, you know, from, from a very I would say, privileged background. And she basically just said, it doesn't matter. I still am the least funded. Out of the cohort, I'm still the least funded. She, no she, it, she's right. She's right. Mm -hmm. But 85% of the folks don't even get to where she is. Yeah. See, that's my, the, yeah. see this, this, is, this is what I'm talking about. She's right. She's absolutely right. 
But we're talking about being in elite, you know, circles. And I, I, if we have the opportunity to even be in this club, in this space, you know, 6.30 or 7 o'clock in the evening where most, a lot of folks <laughs> trying to eat and working and stuff. Okay, we're sitting here listening to beautiful words and, and a beautiful book, but I just feel that sometimes we need to look at the circles that we're in, if that makes any sense of what I'm trying to say. It was why I was trying to say that young woman at Cambridge who was screaming at me. I said, girl, you have a Cambridge degree, okay? That's who you are. And do you want the, 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 us who have this privilege to be here to expand our circles in that way? Or? I, I, would like, I would like, and I, I try to do this for myself, first of all, to expand consciousness. It's very important. You know, um, Okay, I, I'm going to say this because we're here. I thought it was great that people cared about George Floyd. Like they say on the North Tower very much. Why weren't people in the street about, um, there are a lot of things to be in the street about. Why y'all care about Kansas or, or Minneapolis? Why did the whole world get upset about Minneapolis? I'm old enough to tell you black men get killed like that every day. The thing that was lucky about George Floyd is that this young black woman had the presence of mind to stand there with her phone and paste it on, on, on uh, Facebook and people cared. They cared. And then people came out. But that, this stuff is happening in the streets in every city every day. Yes, but that's an interesting point because I feel that, um, because it wasn't even the first time it was on film, people have been beaten up yeah, and King. seen on film. Yes, exactly. Rodney. Rodney King, but there are other people where it's up, happened. I grew up in I also, that kind of atmosphere. Yeah. So I thought it was really interesting that it happened at the point that it did. It happened while we were all in a pandemic, mm -hmm. generally in the mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. There were, people's minds were mm -hmm. quite concentrated on other things. And I feel that that had something to do I agree. with the fact that this incident, this, this spark, was a, it was seen in a way, there was nowhere else to look. Because we, we, we were locked down. We were locked People down. People were watching the same things on Netflix or doing whatever, they were walking, they were, we were contained. I felt that, I wondered also, it's just what I feel, I just wondered if there was also some slight opening of people's empathy. But so, in but a so way, I folks, wasn't sure. Folks were being escorted to Jamaica on flights that these people have been living here since they were, you know, they were two years old. They know nothing about Jamaica, mm. but I didn't see a whole bunch of. I, I'm, I'm just no, saying that, this that, because no, we're yes, in this room. But that, I know, but there okay. were there were protests about those flights. There were people. I know yes, there were. I know in there the were. same way. I know there were. But, and there and there will always be points where people are not, not everybody is informed about everything. At that point, I think it was a particular time um, that this happened in the world. I think it's no coincidence that we were locked down and that people were looking at this because um, it wasn't just the fact that it was on, I agree with on you. thing and I there are things happening. So, I that, agree with you. so I think that was also an interesting thing. It was on top of a lot of things, and sometimes you get that. Things are cyclical. Things come up, and it's almost as if, um, if you but, look but at the graph, but it's, but things it's are changing. But it's a question to place mm. because... What's, the, what's the question? The what's question the question to is, me is? I'm I'm looking at everyone being upset about George Floyd, and I look. I grew up in a community where cops did that every day. Mm. Okay, mm. so and then all the things that are happening here, mm. um, and uh, in other places in Paris, mm. Mm -hmm. in Rome, mm -hmm. uh, Lagos. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to see something worldwide. I wanted to see something, you know, instead of taking a slogan. I wanted to see people dealing on a local level with a lot. And, I, and I think that is work. Very quickly, come speak. in. Yeah, I, I please think, do. I think it's. I completely appreciate all of the points that everyone is making, um, but from my perspective, I'm just glad that it had galvanised some sort of movement. And I would argue that it was global. You know, there were there were BLM protests in Korea. Mm, you sure. know, when has that ever happened before? Well, I, and I think I think it's it's fine to say yes this stuff happens all of the time and i grew up you grew up in that environment and that must have been terrible but i think rather than 
just looking at that ice age as an incident and, and, and coming up with the problems with it. Let's look at where we're going next and, and what, 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 what has come from that really seminal moment. Whatever it happened with George Floyd, let's just be the thankful the that I there has been some sort of movement that's come from get, it. That we get captured. I agree with you. I, and the fact is that there are a lot of people making noises about doing this, doing that, and diversity, and all of this. And it's the same old stuff. It's just but actually, I don't think it is thing. the same old stuff. And you wanted to come on and speak about the Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities. Yeah, yeah, didn't yeah. You? Do, could, could I just ask? Yeah. We do have a question from yes, the of audience. Yes, of course. And we do want to involve everyone. But Charlie, yeah. do you want to come in here? Just real quick. Yeah, yeah I brought I just it up. Want to right. see one engage, engage. You can hear me anyway. Yeah. Um, so, Albie, yeah, I'm partially a convert, so thank you for that. that <laughs> um, but in response to Bonnie's thing, I, I fundamentally disagree with you in several areas, Bonnie. And I think that the I'm doing work, as I'm a doctor, as you know, I do a lot of mental health in schools, and I'm reading about you know, parents communicating with children. If a child comes in and says, look, I'm really pissed off, mum and dad, I was bullied at school today, the parent's response is not don't worry about bullying, there's a logical thing to do, blah, blah, blah. The parent's response is to do empathic listening. And the parent's response is to say, I'm really, you must be really upset about being bullied at school today. That's awful. What do you think we can do about it? So your response to that woman who got up and explained how she was pissed off, I think was an inappropriate response. And to give another example, to Jan Why was it inappropriate? Wait, Why was it inappropriate? Jean Tian, one of the wealthiest guys yeah. in business, worked with Credit Suisse and everything else. He would complain that he goes to a restaurant, this guy is the, you know, he's a mega CEO, right? He's black. He goes to a restaurant, he's parked by the toilets by the waiter, right? That's a valid complaint on his part. It's not to say you are a highly privileged man, you earn five million a year, you live in you've a taken, you, 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 you've taken, you've, 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 somebody being sent, that, seated by a toilet that. is not the same thing, no, okay? Yeah, no, but it's not the same thing, and a valid well, complaint, a valid that. complaint, there a valid, no, you can't just, no, that's yeah. it, right? Okay, <laughs> no, listen, a a, you brought it up, a valid, a valid complaint, Every valid complaint is not the same, right? I think we'll agree to this. No, no, yeah. no, that's not a good... No, no, honestly. No, but it's, well, when, you say, is a, if it, when you say... By actually saying a valid complaint, then it's a valid complaint. So was her... You didn't think... You're saying her, you didn't feel her complaint was valid. No, I didn't feel it was valid. I felt we were in... And now I can say... We were in an academic situation. Mm -hmm. If we were in a restaurant or if we were in a, you know this, mm. I probably wouldn't have said anything, but mm. the reason I was there was for an academic purpose. Mm -hmm. We were going to explore something. We were going to go further. So I wanted her to understand. But what was her actual complaint? It was it about how the academ how her, her position in academia in that world? Was she complaining about? No, she about was angry. I think she felt that I didn't have the right First of all, she couldn't see how anybody black could be on that other side. I mean, that's basically it. And she didn't like that somebody black was on that other side. And I was there for purposes of debate. Mm -hmm. I agreed with Jesse, but I thought, you know, we're, we're in an academic setting. Mm -hmm. Let's have the other side so that we can have a, you know, back and forth. Oh, so she wasn't just uh, arguing against your argument. It was the fact that I had you no business shouldn't have being having that argument. There on that well, this is, a, this is something yeah. that... Albie exactly. picks up in his piece exactly. when he and he we're speaks to that we're not exactly monolithic. we're not monolithic and as he says there are many ways to be and that is a yeah. that is something that we have to I mean the very end of Albie's piece when he says um, I, I'm I'm paraphrasing and you say it better Albie but basically just that we have to look at our own yeah. Suzette so um, therefore race my, my response was appropriate for the setting yeah. Yeah. we were in an academic setting I wanted to explain to her her privilege. It was very important for her because she will go through life when she gets those doors slammed in her face, which will happen to her, even if she's put Cambridge on the piece of paper, that still will happen to her. Yeah, but it did sound, when you, when you, when you gave the example, I mean, to my ears, it did sound as if you were saying not that she actually 
thought you you should not be making that argument as a black person. It's like when somebody says, well, if you're black, that's why you shouldn't be but that's why um, she said a Republican it. But or you shouldn't be but, conservative. No, that's why she said it. Because of where she was. Guys, yeah. I'm not sure which. Yeah, I'm talking about yeah. Cambridge because that's the only one I know yeah, anything yeah, yeah. about. <laughs> yeah, you did mention that. Oh, I mentioned no, it because mine. you brought it up. Yeah. Yeah. Can yeah. I just say, because we do have a lovely audience of people here, and yeah. I really want to bring them up. Bring <laughs> yeah, them let's go. But I, um, but I would just, I have a little bit but just really quickly, because Albie, you touched on it. So we have this amazing collection of 100 stories and 100 ways that we could change the narrative. That's what this book is about, that's and that's what book. the power, great and book. it is a, a diverse range of voices, I mean, of, of every kind. But on, that's one side of the debate. On the other side of the debate, Albie, that we talked about was you know, the most recent sort of touchstone on racism in this country was the famous, or not so famous, Commission on Racial Equity <laughs> report that, that, that has been commissioned and hasn't still been responded to at all. And given the fact that you do know the conservative mindset in some ways. I would really welcome, and then we will open it up completely for conversation, your thoughts about that just juxtaposition of that there is no systemic racism in this country in this country versus these stories of absolutely racism in, in, da in daily life. Yeah, so I think um, the report, in my opinion, was briefed out very badly, and I've said this to all the conservative MPs that I work with. I've said it on national television, I've said it on the radio. Um, and I think it was a real shame that what was briefed out from number 10 was that uh, this report found that there was no uh, such thing as institutional racism in Britain and that we were a beacon for racial equality in the world. <laughs> but the question that I would ask is, how many of you actually read the report other I than did. that headline? I did. So that's four people. And it's poor. Did you read the 24 recommendations? I yes, read the report. I read, yes. I read the report. And, and, but actually, what I would say... And they're not... No, well, hold yeah, on to that. Let me come useful. to that. Mm. <laughs> um, because actually, what I, I've been looking at um, anti-racism anti -racism and equality policy for a very long time, uh, since when I was at university and beyond, and looking at what some of the main um, policy proposals are, from, mainly from the left, because it is really has been a, a, a policy position from the left until now. And actually, there are a lot of recommendations out of the 24, which a lot of anti-racist campaigners have been calling for for mm, a very long time. Mm. Um, and I, I just wish that some of the commentary around the report at the time that it was, um, at the time that it was published was around the recommendations rather than the claim about institutional racism. And I think, I think in my opinion, I would love for us to have a debate about those recommendations, you know, should we be implementing an office for uh, rate, an office for health disparities? Should, which actually I think was implemented in October, should we look at um, essentially decriminalising class B, B drugs for young offenders, which is actually something which Sadiq Khan has brought in in London? So a Labour policy and a Conservative Commission report came up with the same recommendation. Was it should peer we reviewed? Be looking... Was it peer reviewed? This thing? I don't believe it was peer reviewed. I think it was done. I think look, the report wasn't on done very well. I'm not, I'm not pretending. I'm not pretending it was a good report, but if we look at the recommendations of that report, a lot of the recommendations that are in there, anti-racist campaigners have been calling for. for but that. Absolutely, but that was also an interesting thing because those recommendations had been on the books for a long time. So that was also something where I wondered with the report, what actually was its purpose in a way? Because some of it just seemed like it was repackaging something in totally, a new, totally. in a new sort of cover totally. to a certain extent. I think what was there was some insensitive. Certainly, some very insensitive um, language, a way of like, putting like, things. Like, well. But I understood. For instance, when they spoke about um, um, the fact that I mean, people took it on and said that it was it was saying that oh, we were lucky that we came here to have been somehow. I don't think that's what the intention was. I think it sounds why I as if it was if something it was the same way that I speak about being proud of the fact but, that my ancestors went through not because. Because I'm saying, oh yeah, it was great that I came from people who were who were basically living on a plantation in a world of torture, but despite that, this is what. But why they wasn't came. it? So I think that's why it was. Why wasn't it peer reviewed? Because the language was shoddy. It was shoddy, and the thing that that I stuck out at the beginning in the preface, which I thought this should never have got past anybody. 
the, the slavery was implied as the, they said mm. the Caribbean experience. I just thought, what the hell is that? Yeah, so, and it just, so it was, it was, it was, it was kind of yes, stuff. but it was clumsy, definitely, and ugly. But I didn't, I don't feel that that was the intention. Yeah, but no, that, but that, let's not that, get that, wrapped that, up in that. that, 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 that I don't think. Yeah, but I don't. Yeah, that was something. Yeah. Can I just say something about the intention there? Because mm. I know some people who made some very specific recommend were invited by the people to uh, behind the court to people. make some very specific recommendations around business investment, etc. And almost everything that they submitted as was not even included exactly. in the report. Mm was ignored, and they've exactly. come out publicly to say that. Anyway, with that was yeah. an incredibly interesting debate, and what I would like to now... Since Just a have, very final yes, point yes, on yes. that, very quickly. Um, I've never claimed that the report was briefed out in a good way. In fact, I said it was briefed out very badly. Mm -hmm. Yes, maybe it should have been peer-reviewed, but really what we should, should be discussing be. are the recommendations in that report. Absolutely. And we should be encouraging everyone in this room to be writing to their MPs if they've got a Tory MP, and to be saying... Our government commissioned this report. These are recommendations that this Conservative government said they were going to implement. Why haven't they been implemented yet? Uh, we we need, need to be talking about the practicalities of things, not what we're unhappy with about the report, but about what we can take from the report, which is really going to change things for black people. I say in that's Britain. very British. Let's just, do, let's just ignore the bad stuff. I'm not ignoring and it. I'm just no, no, no. So we can it's, actually the, change the thing, from it. The thing was very poorly written. That's the first thing. I but mean, I thought the recommendations I, were good. Well, then why did they just do the recommendations well, and should, not do the well, preface? They should do them, shouldn't we? Shouldn't they? So that's what we should okay. be pushing the government I to do. I thought it was atrocious. Rather than just going through what we hate about it. Yep. That's, a, that's a project for the conduit community to, to push the forward. Exactly. Say, so let's get on with those absolutely. recommendations. So, I promised to invite you all to um, contribute to this lively discussion. <laughs> and I'm very much welcome. So, anyone, you, there's mics and... My mic, anyone who would like to talk, scream, ask a question? Scream at us, scream at us. Take it anyway, but make sure you use it by your mouth. <laughs> okay. Thank you all very much. Um, just want to come back to the point you mentioned about Black Lives Matter uh, being, you know, the protests going uh, right through the world. Uh, you mentioned Lagos, and back to Albi's point about how black people treat black people. I just wonder if you have any thoughts on why the whole movement around Black Lives Matter didn't, in the end, when you think about what happened in Nigeria with NSARS, why that didn't really take off? Brilliant Is it really question. A case Brilliant of, question. Oh, that, yeah, that's how they treat each other. Brilliant question. So I'm just interested in your Brilliant question. Can I, can I say, and we're in, we're in this space, and I feel, uh, I, mean, I, I guess we're being recorded. But I heard the name Black Lives Matter, and I thought, well, of course they do. Who's going to say they don't? So what next? Okay? That, that's the first thing. So what, what's next? Of course Black Lives Matter. What idiot would say they don't? So what's next? Okay? And... It is a social media hashtag, okay, that was, and I think it goes back to what Suzette was saying, we were all locked down, smashed down. Um, all of you who have, are in a different age and different space, you got tons of information about the way things have happened and the way they were. I think the question is that it was, it was not picked up on the ground, in a sense. There were marches, there were things happening, there were people being angry. But as you're pointing out, and that's my question, and you put it a hundred times better than me, change happens locally, change happens with the people. So, okay, it's really nice for people, you know, Black people to get these positions, and for you know the Academy Award, the Oscar community. And I'm only bringing this up because this is my purview. It's nice to have 800 black, you know, people of color now members of the Academy. So damn what? Okay, so that that's that's the answer for me as to why this and why we're stalled. Because we are stalled. I don't quite understand that. Um, because uh, are you saying that because if that's a change or it's 
things happen incommutably. Well, you're saying, what does it matter if there are people joining the academy? Well, surely people joining somewhere or more people doing certain things has got to be an improvement in people not doing something. It is an improvement. But then what you just said sounds as if it was... No, we're talking about... You were asking me a question about change. I wasn't talking about improvement. It's different. And you know because... But the, yeah, but the thing business. is... Yeah, yes, but the thing is, things move a lot. My life, my, as I said, the Maya Angelou, I am the dream of the ancestors. Things change. They improve, they change. And change is hard. I mean, just to change yourself is very hard. Leave alone making big changes anywhere else. So it's, it's going to be increment, incremental. They're going to be small changes. But... I don't know, because what you just said sounds as if it's, I don't know, it just sounds as if it wasn't making any, I, I don't know, I, I didn't quite guess it. I didn't feel hearing that. It's very simple. Join a club. Mm. You become a member of the academy. If you don't have the right cultural environment to feel your authentic self, it doesn't work. So no, no, and can I also add, absolutely right. It's actually it's about the lived experience. It's not about ticking boxes or, or metrics. It's about reality of belonging. But then again, how do you get that to change? Well, you have exactly because you have to be somewhere. No, you have to. Uh, you do. You have to be somewhere and be trying to still be your authentic self as much as you possibly can. And you have to be in that space to start that. And if you're not, st if you're not in the space, you can't get there. So I do understand that because I know I've been in places where I've been the only one who looked like me in so many ways. And I exactly. And I try to do what I can, where I can. But obviously, opening yourself up and being your authentic self is not always easy. But you have to keep having those steps. My steps and the people who made those steps ahead of me and the people who are coming behind me allows them more to be more of themselves. Those people are opening you know, up. So I do understand that. But you have to be in there. No, you have to not want it. You have to not want it. That's right. That's how they get it. But us. if I can... It goes back to your five-year-old self and talk about your poem. That's right. That when you were yourself, you didn't realize that you were black or anybody else. That's it. You, it's fine. you that's have to not, not want it. Well. Yes. You have, to you have not, not want but it. But just very quickly on, your, on the point about not wanting it, I think what's very interesting, and I'm sure you're all going to disagree with me, <laughs> but if there's one organization in the country which some may argue would not want black people to rise to the top or ethnic minorities to rise to the top... You might say that was the Conservative Party. But look at our cabinet, the most diverse cabinet in history. Now, that hasn't happened because the Conservative Party... Let me, hold on, let me finish my point. And we, can come to, we can come to the diversity of socio, socio-economic background in a minute because I think that's an important point that you raise. But in terms of you, have, you say you have to not want it, if we think of an organisation where I think it's happened very naturally, it's not come from diversity schemes and, um, and, and positive discrimination and all, and all of that that we see in the Labour Party. It is the Conservative Party. And I know what, what you're going to say is it's not diverse in terms of background because Rishi Sunak went to Winchester and Kwasi Kwarteng went to Eton. I think you have a point there. But we're all sat here in a, we're all sat here in a members club. I mean, how diverse are we by those standards? Um, and so I think what's quite important is that I do think representation matters. And for a very long time, a lot of, of anti-racist campaigners would speak about how representation was important. And now all of a sudden we have representation. People are saying, no, that's not enough. And no, it isn't enough. But we do have to accept and acknowledge that getting that representation is a good thing, I think. But I, but I, think, but I think we can... I'm saying, well, I'm, maybe accept was the wrong word, but I think we can say. Accept was probably the wrong word, but we do have to... I think, no, maybe accept was the right word. We have to accept that there has been progress in the last 40, 50 years. 
And I think what I really dislike about some anti-racist discourse nowadays is people say things like, it's no better now than it was 40 years ago. It is better now than it was 40 years ago. That is, if you read this book, you will see through the experience in this book that it is better now than it was, I think, 70 years ago, 90 years ago, when the, first, when the oldest contributor in this book was born. Um, so I just think, you know, we need, to ex we need to say society has gotten better. Yes, there's still a very long way to go, but let's take the wins and work on the improvements that we need to make. I can tell you, I was born in 1948, it's not better. <laughs> oh, come on. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Bonnie, that's outrageous. Yeah. Well, oh, I, I missed that. I missed that. What happened? And, you know, uh, we're, we're able that. to be in the conduit. And I know Quasi, and I'm so happy he went to Eton. Um, but, you know, my measure is the people on the ground. I hate using that word, but I'm just say that's where I come so from. So life is not better for black people in 2022 than it was black in 1950. Well, we also thing? have yeah. the youngest yeah. contributor in the book is, he's 15 now, he's 14 years old. So the book spans ages. It spans and it tells the story. And so his, what he's speaking of is something not just too dissimilar to what I was speaking of. And he's 14 years old. So the book does speak. Which is good. Which, it, which, is saying, it, which is saying there are still those same stories being told. And we do know, I mean, the, just the recent re research report, black young people are twice as likely to be unemployed than white youth. Now, today, that report came out in September of last year. So, so you can't, I, we cannot say that things are so much better. I'm well, sorry. I don't think I'll be saying it's so I'm much not better. Saying things are so much be I'm not saying things aren't bad. I'm just saying that when people say things like, Things haven't changed since 1948. I'm sorry, I just think that's nonsense. But we are deporting people. We're deporting people. And I understand, and I understand, and I understand that that is your experience. But if you look at the statistic on living standards of black people in Britain, or even in, I won't speak for the US because I don't know, but in Britain from the mid 20th century and the experiences that they have in the mid 20th, except that we have in the mid 20th century to now, it is very different. Yes, it's not good enough, but I think to say that it's not changed. It's but do you think? True. Do you, uh, I, I think admit that's the, the, the 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 you know the, the living standards uh, because things have improved may have improved. But the gap, if you look at the Runnymede report, the color of money, the gap between black and, and you know black and brown people in this it's country very is it remains constant yes. and similar. It has so, remained so constant. So there's that yeah. discrepancy remains. Yes, yes. and I think. I disagree completely. No, well, well, I know, that's what, the point of the debate. We're going to disagree. Now, the point I would make is that what you're trying to do, and that's your mindset, is to say, look, I'm going to smooth over all this because it's really not as bad as it used to be, and people should just thrill at the fact that things have uh, improved. But you're not acknowledging the fact that a lot of things are not significantly better. Some things are, and I won't disagree with you on that. But the point of people who really want to create change is they want to change things fundamentally, to make it fairer for everybody, for children of mine and others, to have the opportunities they need to have. That still does not exist in a fair way. And the current government are not the sort of people who are going to help us get there. You've spoken of uh, the diversity of cabinet. I was speaking to some kids recently, and I made the point, there's not diversity of thought. Kemi Badenoch, Quasi, it's all corporate capture. They've all got the same mindset. They are not progressive. Would you, know, would you not say that was the same in the Labour Party? I don't want to turn this into... I don't want to turn this into... A, I don't want to turn this into a political thing. Yeah. But I think... Well, my, I'm what, going to argue against, and I'll, I'll take your point. Right? Yeah. We are stuck in Oxford Cambridge debating style as British politics, right? You know, you say this, I say that. It's politics, right? The only way to progress in a society is to form a balance. And in the back, you say the drama thinks it's great, the bass player thinks it's not going to happen here. You create change. You, you ever been to the Oxford get, Union? We get, we get things progressing. Have you ever been to the Oxford Union? I do not want to live in a society where you say this, I say that. Have you ever been to the Oxford but Union? You see, I have no time. Okay, well, I didn't ask you that. I asked, have you ever been there? No, I haven't. Okay, been. you will understand when you go why everything is the way it is because if you look on the walls of the Oxford Union you'll see all of these people on there Can I just uh, and the Cambridge respond? Union as well yes, I'll be, I'll, yes I'll be sorry so what is your name so I can Charlie. Charlie 
So, Charlie, I actually don't disagree with anything that you've said. The only, the, my, the only perspective that I'm trying to bring is something which is just a little bit different from these conversations that we have all of the time, where we talk about how bad things are and we don't acknowledge that there has actually been some change. I've never claimed that enough change has been made. I've just claimed that some change has been made and things are better in the 21st century than they were in the 20th century. I agree with everything that you said. There does need to be more fundamental change. But I don't think that comes from, quite frankly, saying I believe in racism against conservatives. In the last 40 years, th Labour has won three general elections, which means that if we want to tackle racism, if we want to tackle racism in this country, we have to work with the conservative governments that are in power. And, and that is what me and my organisation are trying to do. And yes, there are difficulties. And I come across problems from people within the party, people from outside the party. It's not a very comfortable position to be in, being a conservative anti-racist, yeah. because most anti-racists don't like you, Women. and right-wing conservatives don't like you. But LB. I don't really care. LB. Because ultimately, I know that the only way that we can fight, bring change in this country is if we work with every government uh, you know, we, we, we're going to, we, and most governments we, we, are We're not going to get country. anywhere if we start doing politics. Yeah, we? exactly. Because, <laughs> okay, I just want to. I just want to ask. Sweet. I just want to ask this young this this lady if I answered your question. The first one that you had that you asked. No, okay. no it wasn't. So, it wasn't answered. <laughs> That's, Us. that's, I, so that's, in, well, if in the UK it's about the internalized racism, how we attack each other and hurt each other. Um, yes. Globally, it's more about how black is still boxed. So Nigeria, the Nigerian government could be doing what it's doing in the concept, whilst Black Lives Matter is a huge issue, they could be torturing their people. Um, but the, it doesn't go on the world stage that, that was what I wanted to say. What I wanted to say was that the minute that we stop wanting it, then the things that are out there, they're offered, the little baubles, then the change will, will start to happen. I mean, that's yeah. what I think. I don't, I'm not saying it, that's, but I think the minute you stop wanting it, then the change begins thank, to happen. Thank you, Bonnie, and thank you very much. We, we are drawing it to a close. We can continue <laughs> the conversations over a drink, I think, etc. But I really wanted, before we disperse, um, to invite Suzette, because this book, um, again, please do buy a copy. It's something that, it's yeah, it's a great book. And you dip in and out of it. So many stories from all different perspectives as we've just seen here with just a few of the voices. But this book was also put together and, and, and benefits an important charity that both Suzette and Suzanne um, have, have, have brought to the fore, and I just want you to say a little bit about yes, it. Yes, it's the um, Ashton Jazz Academy, which was started by Patricia Muirhead after her 14-year-old daughter hanged herself. Her daughter hanged herself because of her experience of not feeling that she was her authentic self. So I do understand, and I understood that, but what I, and I'll, I'll go back into that, because what I do feel is important, and I take the essence of what Albie is saying is, we know what is wrong and what needs to be moved in different ways, but we still have to keep moving forward. You still have to try and be optimistic and still, and if the conversation is constantly saying, well, nothing's changed, nothing's changed, it, it, it's not going anywhere. But anyway, the Jazz, Ashton Jazz Academy was started by Patricia Muirhead. It's been going now for about six years. She was the mother of Jazz. Um, Ashton Jazz was, it's named for her daughter. And the, we knew immediately when we, start, when we got the book together that we wanted somebody, something bigger than us to benefit from the profits of the book, um, from the proceeds from the book. And this was, she's, that we or did audition actually different charities, but this spoke to us because this was a girl who was like ourselves, that small black girl who basically was not appreciated for who she was. And that's why it's a very, um, that's one of the most important, that's very important. We want to amplify the stories in the book, but we also want this charity to be um, getting its, um, benefiting from it. Because basically what they do is they work with vulnerable young girls like 
Ashton was, and they run workshops and nights out. They do lots of things. So please do look up the Ashton Jazz Academy, and if you can, try and support them in whatever way you do. Another benefit that was great of the book is that they've actually had um, people who are in the book, artists who've been in the book, who've offered to mentor, to go into the um, and lead workshops and mentor and have classes with them. So that's something else that's been another byproduct um, that's been really, really good, and we're very proud of that association. Uh, we've already had somebody who's offered them a sizable donation, um, and so we're just really glad. And so we keep trying to promote um, the work that Tricia does. She works with several um, char um, boroughs now, and she has, a, I think there's quite a bit of a waiting list because of the work that she's doing, which ultimately I don't believe should be charity work, but we live how we live in a capitalist society, so that's why it's charity. So people have to rely on charities to do this work, which is very, very important for the whole of our society to be able to run and have healthy, functioning children who grow up into healthy, functioning people. So the Ashton Jazz Academy, Academy, please do try and help and support them. Thank you. So thank you, our speakers.